Nothing can kill your sex life quite like Confucianism. For some, having a duty to keep the family line going already can be an ultimate aphrodi anti-aphrodisiac. In my case, the teachings of China's greatest siege did my reproductive capabilities in brutally and permanently. You might say it's especially brutal given that I'm not even Chinese. But it happened largely by my own hand. And it's also made me, more, made me a more virile contender in the propagation of our species than ever before. Confucius may have taken my balls away, but he gave me so much more in return. To be honest, I was never really getting much from the opposite sex to begin with. Some people will tell you that simply being a guaylo in Hong Kong ups your chances in the department dramatically. I can't say whether that's true or not, but it certainly never got me anywhere. This is particularly glaring given the fact that I wasn't just any guaylo in Hong Kong. As it happened, I was the heir apparent of one of the esteemed British trading giants here. The family owned Hongs that famously dominated the colonial economy for much of its history. Unfortunately, this meant there was immense pressure on me to produce a male heir myself. In fact, it was a condition for my inheriting chairmanship of the company. The title of Taipan is sometimes literally translated as top class, or sometimes as big shot. But what it really means is big daddy. <laughs> as my own daddy was more than keen to remind me, if I don't have posterity in the bag, he assured me, he would pass the reins on to one of my male cousins, simply on account of their wives having popped one or two potential print princelings out already. I guess strands of Confucianism worm their way through all families, Chinese or not. And as I said, the pressure to pass one's genetic material down can leave some sons with lifelong performance anxiety. But not me. I wanted to sow my seeds according to the letter of the family law. I wanted to consummate the most precious will of my forefathers with my most precious organ. <laughs> I just didn't have the chance. I don't know whether it was a lack of looks, a lack of charm, or simply a lack of personality after neutering all my own aspirations to serve those of my family. But somehow, this descendant of successful seafarers and merchants just couldn't get the fish to bite. And in the end, it cost me the one thing I had to my name. It cost me my name itself. Not only did I never become big daddy of the company, but once its new big daddy took over, I became its embarrassing bastard child. And eventually, I was thrown overboard altogether. It happened after a moment of crisis for the company. Those familiar with Hong Kong history will know that the sun sets, the sun set on the supremacy of the British Hongs before it did on Her Majesty's empire. They lost their vice script on the economy's vital parts to the younger, hungrier Cantonese conglomerates. The new powerhouses of expansion came to devour some of their white elders in the most hostile of hostile takeovers. And it was one such threat to our family fortunes that officially led to my dismissal. Officially, I say, because while I was accused of mismanaging my responsibilities during the crisis, to me, it seemed a convenient excuse for my cousin to deal with once and for all with a possible lingering threat closer to home. Either way, I was tossed from the family ship, and in my desperation, I clambered onto the nearest vessel. Now, any vessel would have done, but in this case, it happened to be the local beast of a company that had almost swallowed my family's own empire. They accepted me into their upper middle management position and were more than pleased to have me aboard at first. Having a colonial air Brit tucked away in one of their offices was like having a rare albino parrot in the corner of their living room. 
the tycoon himself could, could will me out before the visitors to perform party tricks, like speaking crap Cantonese, <laughs> spilling gossip about the dead taipans, or singing God save the queen like I still had faith in the words. But alas, the novelty of such amusements wore off. Eventually, I found myself becoming just as isolated as I had been in my native habitat. Despite the conspicuous whiteness of my skin here, I became the company's blackest of black sheep. This time, however, I wasn't accused of incompetence. Instead, I was suspected of having lingering loyalties to my old clan. You see, it was here that Confucius properly weird his big bearded head. The tycoon's senior advisors steeped the sage's teachings about family, believed that certain ties could never properly be severed. And so one day, I was forced to prove them wrong with the ultimate severance. That from my family jewels. Castration, whether voluntary or forced, has been the surest way of proving one's loyalty to a leader in Chinese and Asian history. Different methods have been used over time. It's claimed that in ancient Korea, the scrotum was dubbed with feces and then presented for a dog to bite off. <laughs> this may be the most brutal approach, but it's safe to say that they all take, well, they all take balls. <laughs> I chose a traditional Chinese method, which involves removing the whole package, including the treacherous serpent for good measure. In solidarity with those before me, I used only a knife and oil-soaked paper as a bandage. When my direct super superiors learned what I had done, they reacted with horror and outrage. If, if word got out about such an atrocity, they said, it would destroy the company's reputation. The news also made its way to the tycoon himself, and rumor has it that his first response was to weep. To weep with gratitude at the return of his forgotten act of devotion. This conflicting, these conflicting responses shouldn't be surprising. In Chinese history, it was common for court officials to dislike the eunuchs. For a while, the bureaucrats would work hard to cultivate appropriate levels of humility towards their emperor. A eunuch's will was believed to be naturally at one with the masters. Eunuchs were said to be more Confucian than the Confucian officials without even trying. And they were sometimes more likely to have the emperor's ear. Well aware of such history, the senior cronies in my company were afraid. And <laughs> rightly so. For I came closer to their boss's bosom than any of them had after decades of slaving away. I soon became the most trusted advisor. And my will did align itself with his in the most effortless and liberating manner. Yes, liberating. White people think freedom means having choices. But freedom from choice is what the heart really desires. Only monks and priests in the Western world realize this. They yearn to escape their culture's chronic individualism. But even they never succeed, unlike me. By ridding my dual chambers of their proud contents, I was able to fill myself with the will of my Lord in ways that they, with their comparatively petty chastities and self-denials, can only dream of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Someone once defined Confucianism as the secular made sacred, and therein lies its power. Confucius, like the Western spiritual sages, recognized that we need an almighty father to obey even in adulthood. But his success came with realizing we need one in this world. By giving us this, he created a right way to produce real life miracles. Miracles like Hong Kong. 
which we Brits initially berated as barren rock. Our big dicked imperialism blinded us to the riches that can flow from apparently humble, sterile loins. loins. Unlike my British father, my new Chinese father, who was my new almighty father, recognized my potential. He eventually trusted me to manage the most valuable assets of his company, and also those of his private life. These included a modern-day harem. The old man had an impressive number of wives and mistresses, even by Hong Kong tycoon standards, and they were all housed in some luxury apartment complex. I was charged with, visit I was charged with visiting them and lending their grievances a sympathetic ear, one that perhaps only a man of my gender ambivalent position could offer. Maybe it's because I shared similar identity issues, but I had something of a magic touch when it came to comforting the emotional crisis of being, say, a second tier wife whose marital status was only recognized in specific third tier cities of mainland China. As you know, eunuchs can establish a dynasty for themselves by impregnating members of the harem. And this was virtually important. This was vitally important to the emperors. It was vitally important to my emperor, for it turned out that he harbored a deep, vulnerable secret. One that I've never shared until now. I discovered that my divine, omnipotent father was omnipotent in every respect except potency itself. He wasn't just incapable of, of getting it up, but completely sterile. It was his biggest insecurity. This self-made giant toiled and sweated all of his life to build a fearsome empire, but he'd spent himself in the process and now couldn't eat out the one remaining drop needed to fully ensure a legacy. Outside the harem, only I was trusted with this knowledge. More than that, I, I was trusted with, with trying to help him recover his virility. Yes, together we sweated our way through every remedy in the book. Deer antler soup, the horns and genitals of countless endangered mammals, buckets of oysters in the morning, a variety of cocktails and smoothies that I infused with sea cucumber, cobra blood, and secretions of Asiatic toad. <laughs> but none of it worked. And in the end, I think our desperate search wore the old man out. On the day he died of heart failure, I cried far harder than I had when my own natural father passed away. But I had reason then to feel more alive than ever too. For though this big daddy of big daddies died childless, he realized towards the end that he had already found an heir he could trust more than his own blood. Me. He trusted me to look after his precious empire until I too found a worthy successor. For he saw that I understood self-sacrifice, that I was self-sacrifice. I literally embodied it. He trusted that, that I was capable of denying myself the gratifications of whatever arrows I might have been given, all for posterity. And he was right, much more so than he realized. I did know the value of preserving the family riches for posterity. More specifically, I knew the value of Cairo preserving <laughs> You see, I said before that it takes balls to give yourself a big sniff. But if you happen to have brains too, then you needn't commit yourself to the hardest part. That of giving the big snip to your family tree. Unlike methods for amputating your balls, methods for storing their output has advanced impressively over the years. Today, one can have one's sacred seed preserved under stricter conditions than the most expensive Chateau de Fête, and it will last a good 20 years. That's longer than I need to ensure I, I do find a worthy heir of my new empire. 
And I already have a high-rise harem of women buying to help me produce it. And so it turns out, I can consummate the will of my biological forefathers indeed. I'm about to acquire their beloved empire and absorb it into a bigger empire for their genes to rule than they ever dreamed of. All while serving the will of my adopted father at the same time. My adopted father, whose former underlings now serve him by serving their new adopted father, me. But what should they call this new father? Well, it wouldn't work to use the title for the old British bosses. Uh, Taipan, whose Cantonese pronunciation, by the way, is more accurately rendered Taiban. Or in English, Taipan has also become the name of the most venomous species of snake, <laughs> which I think is unjust to associate with me. No. A more fitting alternative has already snuck its way into the corridors of my new empire. Titan. In English, as you know, it's a name of a race of Greek gods. But here in our country, it's also a suitable anglicization of di da, which can mean big eggs, or in local slang, big balls. <laughs> you see, I was never truly parting ways with the family jewels. I always knew they were coming home. From the Taiping Rebellion to the Cultural Revolution, China's tried desperately hard to kill Confucianism. Some foreign observers can't see why, believing it's the most harmless of world views. But this foreigner knows better. When Confucianism's strongest tendencies are fused with radical innovations from the West, it can produce hair-raising results. Like Hong Kong in the 20th century, and China in the 21st, and me. Okay, I, I, I could go on blathering about history, but you know, like the rest of modern capitalist China, I've got the future on my mind. And a business meeting to settle some scores with my wily cousin. Thank you.